So I'm going to talk about um, fake news and fake brands and the search for authenticity. Um, of course, you know, fake news has been around since the time that man learned to speak uh, uh, or write. And a well-known early example, I, I didn't just put this up for a little cultural enhancement, um, a well-known early political example is this 8th century phenomenon known as the donation of Constantine, uh, which has been and was hyped by generations of papists to lay claims to Rome and other parts uh, of the empire. And uh, more recent examples, of course, uh, abound. Um, but it wasn't really until the widespread adoption of the internet that the key conditions uh, arose, and I think of them as costless global distribution, sophisticated publishing tools, and a monetization engine, all of which came together to produce the challenges uh, that we have today. Now, as CEO of Reuters, um, I was um, often accused of publishing fake news, and it usually was by gentlemen like this uh, who didn't like whatever Reuters was publishing about them. I can remember very fondly one of my uh, most interesting days uh, at Reuters was I started in the morning in Tel Aviv at the office uh, of Shimon Peres. Uh, I really wanted to talk about Mideast peace and understand I'm you know, a great optimist, he mostly wanted to talk about nanotechnology and what was going on in the VC community. Um, and I was impressed. He had a pretty good handle on that as well. But he couldn't resist haranguing me about Reuters coverage. And then later on that evening, uh, much to the chagrin of, of my Israeli family, I crossed uh, uh, through uh, over to Ramallah and visited the uh, Fatah com uh, compound and met with Abu Mazen. And the one thing I take away from that day was he too complained, and in his mind, Reuters was overly pro-Israel. And so I ended the day thinking, well, you know, sort of 50-50, that wasn't too bad for one day. Um, and I continued to pay attention to the issue of fake news um, after I left Reuters. And I really, I especially love the uh, incident in 2012 when the U.S. satirical publication called The Onion named Kim Jong-un, the despotic supreme ruler of North Korea, as the sexiest man alive. Let's see if we can get that slide up. No, this is not Kim Jong-un. There we go. That's a Kim Jong-un. Um, the amusing part came sort of the next day when China's People's Daily didn't understand that the Onion reference was really a joke, and so they pick it up with an unbelievable cover, and I, I've got to quote them. So they gush with his devastatingly handsome round face, his boyish charm, and his strong, sturdy frame, this Pyongyang-bred heartthrob is every woman's dream come true. Mm, maybe not. Now, of course, uh, Kim Jong-un isn't the only politician with a crazy hairstyle who's prone to making fake news. <laughs> now, what makes and marks the Donald as a new low in fake news is not only that he peddles in some, you know, truly crazy ideas like the idea that uh, President Obama was born in Kenya, or that the Trump inauguration crowds were larger than anyone others. But it's, it's really his absolute chutzpah to declare that any mainstream media report that dares to point out his lies, he says they are fake news. In fact, the very term MSM, or main, mainstream news media, is considered to be the highest insult in the Breitbart universe. Now, before I uh, go on to become a, on a permanent audit flag in the IRS file, 
I should turn uh, attention to talk a little bit more about the internet forces, um, which I mentioned earlier, that are driving fake news. And John Steinberg and others have mentioned them in previous panels, but just to go through them again, the first one is nearly costless global distribution. The second is sophisticated publishing tools. And the third is a built-in monetization engine. Now, items one and two sort of require little further uh, clarification. Uh, uh, and, you know, the average blogger can now produce content that looks almost as good as the New York Times, and hence the ease on confusion as to what is believable media and what is not. Um, but the third factor, the monetization engine, uh, bears a little further discussion. You know, in, in pre-internet days, um, publishers could only really tap subscription and advertising revenues through direct sales forces or advertising agencies or media buyers. And, you know, that created a chokehold, but it also created a certain quality, maybe even authentic authenticity stamp at best. And advertising became this mana from heaven. Uh, in that it subsidized what would otherwise have been higher cost subscriptions. So for example, you know, I could subscribe growing up in New York to the New Yorker magazine and read, you know, incredible fiction by great authors, poetry, in-depth uh, 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 articles and studies, and it cost a fraction of a dollar. And, you know, that seemed out of whack with the effort that went into, you know, writing 5,000 word essays. Um, but, you know, this over-reliance on, on advertising, I think, bred a monster in the internet era as traffic was driven to ever more sensationalist and clickbaited click sites. We've skipped ahead one uh, ad, but um, what these pictures uh, show are advertising campaigns that I think have begun to go the other way. Um, the other way in the sense that people are so fed up with hyped and fake looking advertising. Every woman in every ad has the perfect body uh, that we're now starving a generation of teenage girls to look like that that it was very courageous uh, when the Unilever uh, Dove brand chose to put real women uh, into their ads. And the Target also, which sells across the nation, including uh, uh, in this nation, including into some very conservative areas, also decided to challenge norms with, uh, you know, regular guys, let's say. Um, so I think what we've begun to see, which is lampooned a little bit in this cartoon, is a backlash, a backlash in the sense of uh, we are trying to achieve a certain level of authenticity now in our advertising. And sometimes it's a little bit, um, a little bit feigned. Uh, uh, you know, we're working really, really hard to seem fake authentic. But I think, in general, the, uh, uh, that backlash, and maybe it's consistent with 500,000 new subscriptions to the New York Times as well, um, that's a healthy thing in general for our markets. Um, I wanted to go on just and, and end by talking a little bit about authenticity also uh, for personal brands. So in the bad old days, a CEO could tell one story to his board, and by the way, it usually was him, one story to his board, one story to investors, one story to analysts, one story to the media. Um, but these days, uh, one really has to tell the same story to every audience, because not only do they talk to one another, um, one is beginning to be held to a standard of, hey, you can't tell uh, the labor union that you're never going to lay off a single person and then turn around and tell your investors in the analyst community, hey, isn't this great? We're going to cut a huge amount of cost by firing all these lazy people. And, you know, I for one think that that's a very good thing. 
Um, I wish it would come uh, to a political moment, but over the last 48 hours in this country, it's beginning to feel like this idea that you just can keep on telling one big lie after another, maybe that's beginning to catch up as well. And, and on that happy moment, at least a happy moment for me, I, I shall leave you today, and thank you.